live, where news comes first. This is ABC7 Extra. Good evening, I'm Maria Garcia and this is ABC7 Extra. Thanks for joining us on this Sunday evening. When you say you're from El Paso, what does that mean to you and to the rest of the world? El Pasoans in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s would probably respond to that question differently. Our city evolves with every generation and so does our connection to it. How we identify with it, explain it to others, how we defend it or criticize it. And this isn't just an El Paso thing, this is a regional thing, a border thing, a cultural thing. Las Cruces and Juarez, you play a role too. So joining me, join me on this conversation. The city has focused in the last three years on revamping our image to the rest of the country. And with the It's All Good EP campaign, there's more El Pasoans than ever showing pride and sticking up for the city on social media. We're going to talk about that too. We're also going to delve into how the city's image to outsiders and to ourselves helps shape who we are. Where we come from is a big part of our own personal identity, our sense of place in the world. What role does investment in our region and policy decisions about jobs or quality of life help shape our own lives? Joining me tonight is Dr. Richard Bineda, an El Paso native who returned to El Paso 10 years ago to join the faculty at UTEP and is the director of the Sam Donaldson Center. His research includes work on culture and identity, plus Stefan Posinger, vice president of Midoff Burton Partners, the marketing and advertising firm working with the city and the CVB to portray a positive image of El Paso to us and to the rest of the country, plus Peter Schwarzbein, a conceptual artist whose work revolves around what it means to live and to be from the border. We really want to hear from you on what El Paso means to you. You can email us your comments or your questions now to abc7extra at kvia.com. You can also reach us at 496-1775, of course the area code there, 915, or tweet me at mariagabc 7 all right, so joining us now for our discussion, Dr. Richard Bineda, Stephen, Stephen Posinger, and artist Peter Schwarzbein. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to cover a lot of ground here, but first I just want a short, concise statement from each of you. What does El Paso mean to you? What does it mean to you to be from here? And Dr. Bineda, we'll start with you. Well, one of the reasons I came back 10 years ago, Maria, was because El Paso represented then and does now uh, a dynamic place where not only the, the community history seems to be present every day, but the possibilities and the potential uh, are essentially limitless. And, and that drove my decision to leave California and come back to El Paso. It's a decision I haven't regretted a single day that I've been back. Mm -hmm. Stefan, for you? Uh, El Paso right now represents uh, a, a great deal of pride and a time of change and progression. We're moving in a direction that uh, I've lived here most of my life since first grade and uh, every five years or so we think we're about to turn the corner, we think we're about to do something great and something gets in the way, something stops us uh, and in the last year and a half, two years we've seen some really big changes that aren't going to stop that momentum. It's going to continue to move forward mm -hmm. uh, and El Paso is going to become a great city uh, in the southwest like it once was. Again. Right, right. You hear that over generations, right? Our, our parents who say, you know what, back in my day you would hear about El Paso's potential too. Uh, so, so Peter, what does El Paso mean to you? Um, um, I think El Paso means to me is to be a part of the largest binational um, community in the entire world, the El Paso del Norte region. And I think to be from here um, provides you with a unique vantage point um, into two worlds and into negotiating um, an increasingly globalized world. And I believe that people from El Paso, whether they're living here or they're expatriates, they have a unique viewpoint and message to bring to the world. And so it's very exciting to be from here and then to be able to come back and to contribute as well. Right. You, you, were, in, you were in New York City for yes. about 10 years before you moved back. I was in New York for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. All back. right. Well, I, I want to I talk about um, that unique perspective that, that you touched on. Uh, so by many accounts, we're not Texan enough. Uh, we're, we don't fit into mainstream U.S. culture. We have, there's a Mexican aspect to our city and our culture here, but we're not Mexican enough here either. So for a long time, there's been this sense of otherness in El Paso. Uh, are we finally embracing that otherness and, and, and learning how to capitalize on that, do you think? Well, I, I think what, what you see, and, and I can only sort of talk from my own perspective as being a member of the arts community here in El Paso is that um, within the art scene, you're, they're sort of the canaries in the coal mine, and you're seeing that artists from El Paso and Juarez are 
choosing are choosing to make work that really doesn't necessarily define themselves as being from Juarez or being from El Paso. Essentially, they're from this region, the capital of the border, which is what El Paso and Juarez and southern New Mexico are, where our own unique area and region. And so you see artists sort of leading the way in destroying that border culturally between the two cities and in the region. And now it's a question of can it happen economically and, and other ways? Can we have a strategic way to view and position ourselves for the 21st century forwards as the capital of the border? Yeah. And, and, and we're going to get to our relationship with Juarez and how that's a big aspect of our identity. But, but Dr. Pineda, that, what, what do you think about this sense of, of otherness that I think for so long it led also to a sentiment almost of uh, a self-deprecation? Sure. Because, because we felt sort of so isolated culturally from, from the rest of the country, the rest of Texas, you know, from Mexico, even from our southern neighbor. Uh, you know, I have to explain it to colleagues of mine in other parts of the country that, that El Paso for the longest time seemed to have a really uh, subtractive way of thinking, that, that it was really, we've lost out, uh, we're losing people, this is, this is a place that, that seems to be teetering. And, and it seems to me that, that one thing that's changed radically over the time that I've been back is that we've, we've really adopted a much more additive approach, which is to talk about the things that we have, uh, to talk about the strengths that we have, and then and to move forward from those strengths, uh, recognizing that, that you know, we, we have to consider uh, some of the things that people see as challenges as, as benefits. And I think that's the point that Peter's making, which is uh, we have all of these things that are, that are connected to our geography and to our history. Uh, and I think for a lot of people to move the conversation forward, it can't be about the things that we've lost. It has to be about the things that we've got and that we're moving forward on. And, and that's why every conversation that centers around brain drain is starting to drive me a little bit crazy, because in some ways, that conversation is never going to be resolved. The conversation needs to move uh, and be talked about in terms of brain gain. And you've got a tremendous inflow of people that are in El Paso that have gone away, that have come back. And as soon as we start to move that conversation away from subtractive and saying we don't have those things and talk about the things that we have, we, we I think, make that conversation more viable for ourselves. Uh, but, but I mean, essentially, brain drain it is part of our history. In the 90s, we were the biggest sure. exporter of, of young professionals. Uh, and so it, it, it is part of, unfortunately, you know, uh, who, who, who we are. But I think that the, the issue, though, that the reason that I think that, that we need to change the rhetoric of the way we talk about it is that that's true in any city, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. I mean, people move away from communities for different reasons. I think that the issue we should talk about are the people that have come back and talk about the strengths that they bring. I mean, this is a conversation that, that I think the three of us at some point or other have engaged in a lot because I think we have that perspective. I think the question is how do we engage people who wouldn't normally be part of that conversation and say, what what is it that we can build off of the, the strengths that we see? Because it's not just single item entities. I think if we resort to a checklist and say, well, we have this, we have this, we have this, we're never going to move the conversation forward. It has to be a, a much broader conversation of what we do have. And I, I will say one of the most important things, though, to, 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 the, to your point why we had braid drain why people left El Paso one of the main reasons you leave a city is because of quality life or lack thereof right. and El Paso didn't have a great quality of life we've made a huge investment in our quality of life over 70 percent of the voters voted in over 500 million half a billion dollar billion dollars in quality of life bond initiatives we are saying as a city there's an attitudinal shift among our citizens that is mm -hmm. saying we are fed up with that we want to change so we want to see a difference, and that is going to come. And so, so we don't need to apologize for ourselves That's anymore. Right. We need to live in our own skin. We mm -hmm. are El Paso, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to be proud of that. And mm -hmm. I think uh, that, that conversation is changing. Um, we're doing it through the Digital Ambassador Program. El Pasoans are signing up to spread digital goodwill on their own for free mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of their social mm -hmm. network. We're getting millions of impressions uh, since we began the program. We're the largest municipality in the nation uh, uh, with, uh, you did a story the other night on the Digital Ambassador Program. Mm -hmm. uh, we are kind of the poster child uh, for uh, Digital amb Ambassador Programs for municipalities. So you're seeing a shift in attitude in El Paso among El Pasoans. Uh, good things are happening here, and good things are happening to El Pasoans, and, and I think it's time to change that conversation. And, and, and I think what it comes down to, uh, aside from quality of life, is also jobs, and, and that comes from policy decisions, uh, so, uh, among other things. Uh, Peter, you were going to say I mean, something I think, about... I think when, when you're looking at jobs, I think what you're looking at is you really have to have you know, the quality of life is great, and the bonds are a great thing, and I think that it's a great step towards it. But what comes next has to be a comprehensive socioeconomic strategy for this region. It has to be looking at what can we offer 
not as a mid-sized American city, not with what Oklahoma is doing or San Antonio is doing or Tucson is doing, but what can we offer as a region that can, that can make us competitive at a global level? Because the reality is that for 40,000 years, you have had humans cross through this mountain range. They've gone through this river valley, north to south, and later with our transatlantic, with our trans, um, trans uh, continental railroad, east to west. So this has always been a place of border crossing, and we are a port city. So how is it that we can take those natural resources that we have? The fact that this is a major port of entry, the fact that this place is, for thousands of years, been a place where people, goods, culture have crossed and amplify it and understand it and make it palpable to the entire world. And that's really, I think, the kind of thinking we need to have. And we better be ready for it quick because we're growing at twice the rate of the national average mm -hmm. among cities in terms of our population. So mm -hmm. we're growing fast. We better be ready. We are. Uh, we see it in new neighborhoods throughout the city. All right. So when we come back, we're going to talk about that, our relationship with Juan. As you're watching ABC7 Extra, stay with us. Be part of the conversation. You can email us your comments, your questions now to abc7extra at kva.com. By phone, we're at 915-496-1775 or tweet me at Maria G ABC. You're watching ABC 7 Extra, where news comes first. Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. Glad you're still with us. We're talking about El Paso's identity. Uh, glad you're still with us. So let's get to our relationship with Juarez. Uh, you know, two sides of that coin. Uh, for so long, it, it was an asset, and, and it still is. It's, it's a strong asset of El Paso's identity. There's no question about that. Uh, at the same time, though, when there's violence in Juarez, El Paso's image kind of gets tattered in the national media. We get lumped in with that uh, and that's why we have campaigns in part it's all goody piece sort of stemmed from trying to prevent the national media from lumping us with the what is violence so so how do we sort of handle that ebb and flow with our southern neighbor I, Stephen, I, yes. What we've done in the last uh, year and a half, two years, uh, is told the media outside of El Paso a story of El Paso that doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on here, or doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on in Juarez. Um, for years, the stories that came out of El Paso had centered around the violence in Juarez, while at the same time we were the second safest city in the row, uh, in the right. uh, in the nation in a row. At that time, we became the third, and now we're the fourth. Four years in a row, we're the safest city. We have a completely different story to tell than what was going on over there. So we told the media, and we pulled the media outside of El Paso, and they told us they don't have a positive view of El Paso, and they don't have a negative one. They had a very neutral idea because they didn't know. So we started right. feeding them these positive stories about El Paso. Mm -hmm. They started to tell them, and we've received over $5 million of what's called editorial impact. Basically, that's uh, uh, getting space on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. Space you can't buy, but has a value. If we were to buy that space, that would have cost us that money. Right. Uh, but what we're doing is we're pitching stories to the media, natural stories, real stories about El Paso. So your comment that the nation sees El Paso in a different light is actually changing. They're starting right. to tell right. real stories. Why is right. Detroit going bankrupt, yet El Paso is passing $500 million in bonds? There's a different climate right. here. There's a different story. There's something that the media wants to learn about El Paso. So. Right, and, and, and you know, we, we, in the last uh, year and a half, we've seen stories in the New York Times, yep. online, in the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. the Atlantic cities. Washington and like Post. you said, if, if mm -hmm. you were to Value, yeah, value that. that. That's yes. more than five million dollars. Yes. There tends to obviously there's more readership in art, in actual there's articles, a pass and readership. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, what do you think about our our identity as a region? Uh, if you include Las Cruces and Ciudad Juarez, how do we identify as a region? I mean, I okay. think the Greater Chihuahua Desert region, region, the Paso del Norte region, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, is is one that's completely unique you know and it's one that that we can never escape you know i understand from a pr point of view needing to distance el paso from juarez but culturally and economically we're we're joined at the hip and we will always be joined at the hip so how is it that you take the spaceport that's out by crucis and you know the the maquilas and the manufacturing industry that exists in juarez and the research and development opportunities that exist in Fort Bliss and exist in UTEP and exist in Texas Tech and the medical opportunities that exist at Texas Tech School of Medicine. How do you take those and really maximize them and supersize them and have them working together? 
How is it that we can have a, a vision where we can become a global manufacturing capital, not for solar panels, doing research in Fort Bliss and UTEP together and then manufacturing them in Juarez? Like, those are the kind of opportunities I think we have here as, as a potential global near sourcing capital. Right. And I think that that's kind of where we should be looking at. And, and how, what do you think about that? How do we capitalize on that? Well, <clears throat> I, think, I think there's really, there's two answers from my perspective. The first is that the conversation that's happened, I think, about WADIS is often, uh, I think, forgets the human face of what's going on. And so I think that the, the work, especially that's been done in the arts community and some in the music community, has really tapped into uh, both the frustration of what's going on, but also I think it serves as a place for people to, to have a dialogue and discourse. I think the second question, and one which I think is a much bigger issue for El Paso, uh, and I think that this, this is starting to change, but I think this is an issue now. Um, we, I think, as a community, oftentimes have a. Uh, we're one of the the communities that I've I've lived in that has the strongest sense of pride. But we also have some of the the most dismissive. I mean, in conversations about how we talk about ourselves, we're also some of the most dismissive people uh, about our own accomplishments and and. I, I can call my baby ugly, but you can't. Call that's, my baby that's, ugly, exactly, right? that's, that's exactly. That's exactly. That's that's exactly right. And I think that the conversation about what's gone on in Juarez. I mean, I think that that it's it's starting to be addressed. But I think, uh, as as Peter points out, the, the question is how do we bridge those cultures and and not only make those linkages, but also talk about. I mean, this is this is one of those things where an honest conversation about some of the weaknesses and the strengths has to come together, but it can't be dismissed. I mean, I, I think that what happens all too often in El Paso is people are very quick uh, to to be critical of Juarez be critical of, of uh, what happens in Wadis and not recognize that for most of the people in this community there's history in Wadis. And I think right. forgetting that and, and sort of treating this as a, a, a short-term uh, sort of malaise means that we don't deal with the, the real issues. And having those conversations, I mean, I think they're happening. I think to get to your point uh, from the very beginning, I think it's, it's really now about uh, making sure those conversations can happen between policy leaders in the same way that it's happening between artists, in the same way that it's happening between yep. students. Because right, okay. th there, there are too many interesting things that are going on, uh, and, and it falls prey to another issue that we have in El Paso, is that we get really excited and ramped up about one thing, and then once, once it, as Stefan pointed out, once it loses its momentum, we just sort of back off and say, oh, well, we're just not going to try that again, or, and, or, or and we don't like that. And the other thing to add on to that, that mm -hmm. I've, I've noticed, because I, I have been away for over 12 years and came back about two and a half years ago, is that there's a, a mentality in El Paso where if it's not your thing, then it's automatically a bad thing. And there's this, this almost junior high mentality in El Paso. And it sort of s it, it keeps this city back because rather than people work together, and it doesn't make a difference whether it's in the art scene or within policy circles, that if it's not my idea or it's not my project, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And in order for this, this city and this region to grow, like we need to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a very important And I strongly I feel there's an attitudinal shift that it is beginning it is. to change. I think it is. I mean, I, I see El Pasoans. You're an expatriate. You came back. You saw the potential. Uh, there, there's plenty of, of other stories like mm -hmm. this that I mean, are out a, there. It's a totally ridiculous title, the can-do capital. But you see it here. You could, in another city, and being in San Francisco or New York or something, wanting to open up your own thing would have been impossible. But coming into El Paso, yeah. you can open up your own yoga studio. Yes. You can open up your own gallery. Yes. You can go right. and try things that you wouldn't be able to do things otherwise. Things are more accessible. Yeah, right. and, and well, many I, times I, people respond. And I, I do want to uh, say what some of our viewers on Twitter, a lot of people sounding off. Oh, wow. um, uh, Miguel. <laughs> Uh, before you even made your point about how we sort of defend El Paso fiercely, uh, but then sort of make fun of ourselves at the same time, Miguel says, I find that a lot of people from El Paso put it down, but at the same time stick up and defend it when outsiders put it down. So a great point. Remember the fight? We had the fight right. that saved the fight. Somebody from outside of our community uh, who lived in San Antonio or Austin said that we were a dangerous community and couldn't hold this fight, yet we've been the safest city three years, now four years in a row. What's How can we let that happen when somebody in our own state is saying that about our city? They have, they have no connection to our city. They don't yeah. get it. And we are the safest sense. city in the United States, not the most dangerous. Right. So. And, and uh, Ke Ke so Calvin says, there are just too many people that don't want change. Minor Joe says, El Paso represents great people Great weather and a sense of feeling, uh, a sense of feeling safe with family and friends. Yeah, Quote: absolutely. El Paso, it's all good. Uh, Calvin all also good. says, "I feel that El Paso has potential for advancement and being competitive with other cities." Okay. All right, we need to take a break. We're going to take more of your comments and questions when we come back. So stay with us. 
Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. We're talking about El Paso and how we connect with our city and our region. Richard tweets at us, evolution also involves economic growth, better jobs, art and policy don't pay bills. Uh, so, so, you know, this viewer uh, reflecting this idea that it all comes back to jobs and economic growth. Can you talk about that, Dr. Pineda? Well, I, th I think there's two things. I, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive, and I think that, that it's important to, to think about that. I also think that it's important to consider that economic development uh, is constantly moving. I mean, the city is constantly moving uh, right. the ball on economic development. And I think one of the issues that people forget about, I mean, it, it's nice to be able to point to, uh, you know, development like the fountains and say, well, you know, this is a, a keystone project. We've accomplished this. But the, the thing is that on a day-to-day -day basis, the city and private entrepreneurs are constantly moving mm -hmm. uh, money into the community. And I think that this is uh, another one of those issues. I mean, I think that, that one of the biggest questions that that really should uh, impact people is is uh, how they can develop a better understanding of some of these issues. I think um, understanding development, understanding what the city does, requires uh, a little bit of attention on the part of citizens and, and a lot more involvement. Uh, Engagement. Because I think one of the questions is is whether or not you've got uh, a sense of participation. And, and that participation is crucial because if you can have a small number of people making big decisions, then there's always going to be somebody at the end that says, well, my voice wasn't consulted and I'm not part of this conversation. But in fact, you've had that opportunity. And I think that's, you know, for me with my students at UTEP, it's, it's a point of, of concern, so much so that I talk about this in class. I say, you know, you've got to become active. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be activist. I mean, it can be uh, right. engaged in, in, in other activities, but, but understand what's going on. I mean, have that civic participation, uh, you know, whether it's through social media campaigns, whether it's through participating in art. People have to see that there's a usage for that, right? They've got to know that there's people going to the museum. They've got to be able to say, we have X number of people that are using the library. If people don't use those things and the first time they get closed, somebody says, well, I can't believe that was taken from my neighborhood. Honestly, the truth is that it's because people in, in communities have not been active. They haven't taken advantage. And, and I think I'm not talking about, you know, making people social entrepreneurs. I'm saying that you've got to be active in the community that's here and take advantage of things so that, that we can scale things up. I think that's incredibly important and a lot of people are not very accurate about how they describe those circumstances. And uh, Stephanie, you were talking about quality of life. I mean, quality of life plays an essential role in economic Absolutely. development. A huge role. Um, but I, I also think in, from an economic development standpoint, you can't just buy jobs. Right. Um, but you have to have a strategy to try to obtain them. The city has just invested in an individual to be the director of our economic development, right. who I know and I trust, I think is going to do a good job, and they're going to have that, that vision, if you will, to bring more retail, more opportunities here in El Paso. Look at some of the retail chains that have opened in El Paso. Specs set records. Uh, P.F. Chang set records. Payway set records. Krispy Kreme set records. These, 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 these franchises come into El Paso and all of a sudden set opening records. Uh, El Pasoans have some disposable income to spend on themselves and we see that they do it so there is a demand and and you know I alluded to it earlier we have this rapid population growth twice uh, the net the national average we're gonna have that more more of that demand uh, for that retail and for those different economic development opportunities if you will so um, I see that coming up I mean uh, uh, a lot of this growth is going to be organic. It's going to just have to happen right. because this city is growing fast. Okay, I want to make sure we get to um, a caller. I believe we have a caller on the line. If you can tell us your comment or your question and your name. It was Edward from the West Side. And hi, you're Edward Benavides here. Just want to let you know I am absolutely impressed to see your energy, and it's finally great to see someone talking positive about El Paso. There is nothing more that bothers bothers me more when someone says I hate El Paso, I can't stand it, and stuff, and blah blah blah. I'm the first person to tell them there's the interstate ahead, east or west. Hey, hey Edward, like sign, sign up and to I be have a all digital the energy ambassador. That you do, and I think El Paso is growing in a very fast pace. Yet you almost that we still have the small hometown feel. So, Stephen, you know, you're doing a great job out there. I love your energy. I love your energy that you have behind what you're saying. And people, viewers, look at his power. Look at his energy. He's an excited person in El Paso. That's what we need more of. Okay, thank you so much to Edward I, for that phone call. Go ahead. It's all good. Add to that point. Um, that I think that really what what we need to understand and move forward, is, and I think quality of life is, is absolutely a central part of it, but we need to understand ourselves here and the more that we can understand ourselves culturally the fact that we aren't part of we you know we're part of texas we're part of new mexico we're part of chihuahua but at the same time we're part of none of them we're our own thing we're the capital of the border the 
El Paso that we need to understand that that's our place. And the better that we can understand that and the better that we can then create a strategy, not a tactic, but a strategy, um, is a way that we can attract that kind of robust economy where it's not just, you know, different chains coming in here, but actual, actual understanding and focus and execution towards growth of, of systemic um, economic possibilities. And I think that starts with, it's an, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's from a couple years back, but the capital of border, I think, is a really great way strategically to start to look at this. To start so sort to of look at this understanding region. ourselves and our connection to this place. Yeah, the yeah. fact that we're not like any other, the fact that we are our own unique thing. And that mm -hmm. fact that the best wall you could build in El Paso and Juarez is a wall around the two cities. Because Mexico City and D.C. just need to leave us alone. Because, <laughs> because it's true, the best way that we could understand ourselves and the best way that we could be prosperous is to let us work it out and to let us build our communities here together. And, and he brings up a really good point. I'd like to explain something that's near to my heart and in my business, what I try to get across every day. He likes capital of the border. We have it's all good, three words out there right now. We've had other taglines out there. That is not our brand. We need to understand that. We're here today talking about our image. His point about DC and where we stand, that's our brand. That's our image, the way we react, the way we feel about our city. Our brand is not what we tell people it is. Our brand is what people say we are what people say about us it's how they feel about us so that attitude needs to shift that needs to change within people it can't just be done through some line it's all good we'll come and go it's just a window dressing if you will um, at least it's a promise we can live up to right now because uh, things are good in our community um, but that's important to understand Th these kinds of things that are going on this is our brand we need to live it uh, not three words not uh, a tagline or a slogan and then I do want to mention we'll have um, a link to the it's all good EP website on our own website kva.com for people absolutely sign up to become a digital be ambassador and you can earn points and all sorts of good things so okay uh, Richard what do you think about that sort of sense of place within ourselves our connection to our city I absolutely agree and I, I think one of the things that that um, I would love to see, and I think that we're we're having a much more uh, robust debate. I mean, when when there are issues that are controversial, I think there's a lot more people that are willing to be vocal and activist in the community. But one thing that strikes me is that oftentimes that conversation ends the moment that the problem is resolved, or if, if something is taken down, it's it's about perpetuating a conversation that goes beyond. Once we can do that, and once that that conversation is civil, and, and we're engaging with each other, then I think a lot of things we're talking about will really come together. Okay, I want to thank each of you for joining us. Thank I you. really appreciate it. It's been really nice to speak with uh, a panel of El Pasoans. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching us on ABC7 Extra. We hope you have a great week. Bye-bye.